I will start with the first talk, and this is about some basic concept in transplant immunobiology um, that explain why do we reject a transplant. But, you know, this also explains a lot of what we do in the clinic, and I truly believe you, we cannot treat transplant patients if we don't understand those, those concepts. So this is Sushruta, this is the father of surgery. This is the first transplant surgeon we, uh, we know about. In the 600 years before Christ, he did, transplant, uh, he did nose reconstruction using autografted skin. And this is when uh, we transplant tissue from the sa same individual in the, into different area. And the immune system in this case do not recognize uh, this as a, as a foreign uh, antigen and do not attack. And this is the same case, the same scenario with the isographs. Th those are tissue transplanted between individual of the same species that are genetically identical. In a human, those are the uh, identical twins. And this is the case of the first kidney transplant uh, that was uh, successful done in the Brigham in more than 60 years ago. And in this case, the immune system of the recipient do not recognize the donor kidney as uh, foreign and do not attack. And those patients do not need uh, immunosuppressants. This is a uh, Italian surgeon that in the 16th century did also autografted skin uh, very successfully, but he consistently failed with allograft. And this is when he take tissue uh, uh, from individual of the same species, but that's genetically non-identical into a different uh, uh, individual. And in a human, this is the, the case of all transplantation except identical twins. And this gave the first hint of the immune rejections, but not until Peter Midauer in the early 1940s that um, you know, th th this concept was well described. And Peter Midauer is the first scientist to suggest that if we give immunosuppressant, we can allow allotransplantation. And the xenograft is when uh, tissue transplanted from one species to another. And uh, unfortunately for the animal, this is how things are um, considered, uh, at least for the time being. So we'll start with the first question. A 25-year-old woman with ESRD secondary to reflux nephropathy is status, status post zero antigen mismatch living related transplant from her twin brother. Which one of the following is true? No need for maintenance therapy in this perfect match case. No risk for acute or chronic rejection. Induction therapy should be with depletional therapy. This match is perfect for major and minor transplantation antigens or none of the above. So I'll give you a few seconds to answer. Okay, so let's see here. Hmm. Okay, I'll go back to this uh, question after we go over this section. So what you need to know from this slide is although the immune system differentiates from the same origin, the same stem cell in the bone marrow, there's two big arms. There's the innate immunity and there's the adaptive immunity. The adaptive immunity are the, those T and B cells that have the machinery to recognize specific antigens and to, rea to react against those antigens and develop memory against those antigens. The T cells are called T cells because they are born in the bone marrow, but they differentiate, they mature in the thymus. And the B cells are called B cells because they mature in the bone marrow. So the T cells have a T cell receptor that can recognize specific patterns of protein, of antigens, and uh, react to them. Every few T cells have one T cell receptor that is the same, and those T cells are called a clone of T cells. And when we're born, we're born with those billions of T cell clones that recognize all these potential patterns of antigens. So when we have an infection, it's not that our, all T cells go after this infection. Only those few T cell clones that recognize some antigen on this pathogen will go after this infection. And, and this is the, the same case in the transplant. 
when we have a, uh, a, a kidney transplant, only very few clones will recognize this allo antigens and will re react against it. But what we do currently is we suppress the whole immune system. This is why we, we develop all these infection and malignancies. And because we suppress all these clones that are ready to react against those different patterns of viruses or, or any new antigen that form on tumors. So um, the uh, B cells under the, um, under the control of the T cells that are already activated will differentiate into antibody-producing cells, and those are the plasma cells. And the, uh, those, the antibody they start producing are very specific to the clone of T cell that stimulated them at the first place. And then the, uh, however, for the innate immunity, this is a non-specific uh, uh, system where they react to stress. And this stress doesn't have to be an infection or an antigen. You can have a trauma and you have swelling, and this is, uh, could be related that the innate immunity reacted to the, the stress here. But also, when the T cells get activated, they secrete cytokine that will call the innate immunity and will activate them. So what we're going to talk about today is how do our immune system recognize those alloantigen on the, on the kidney? How the T cell get activated? And if we understand how T cell get activated, we can understand all the mechanism of action of the different medications we currently use, uh, and then how the rejection uh, will occur. So first, first thing is how T cells recognize a specific antigen. So to do that, you need two structures. You need a T cell receptor on the first surface of T cells that, can rec that has different uh, patterns and can recognize different antigens. So, and then you need a structure that presents this antigen to the T cell receptor. And this is what we call the, the major histocontability molecule. And the MHC uh, molecule, the MHC complex is this cluster of genes that produce those molecules. In a human, it's called the HLA complex. It's present on chromosome, chromosome 6. And those MHC molecules are present on all cells. So if you have an infection, uh, a pathogen that invades a cell, the cell will process this pathogen, will present part of it on, on, on the, through the MHC on the surface of it, to flag it for the T cell clone that are circulating, to rec the, the T cell, specific T cell clone that recognize this infection to get activated and uh, remove the infection. So, um, so we have two classes of HLA molecule. We have um, class one and class two. Class one has different subtype ABC. Class two has different top, subtype DR, DPDQ. So if this is only, you know, a uh, you know, a structure that presents antigens. So why do we need two classes of it? Why do we need this, this, uh, this diversity? So while class one only present, uh, present on all nucleated cells and, and present antigen only to CD8 T cells, and this is important, because CD8 T cells have the machinery to kill. So when they, they stimulate a CD, CD8 T cell, the CD8 T cells will, will start killing the cell that harvests the, uh, uh, the, the infection. With the, um, the class two is only present on antigen presenting cells, and those are professional messengers that go around, look for a uh, foreign antigen to carry them, to present them to, to the immune system. So those, they don't want, present, they don't want to present those, uh, their antigen to CD8 T cells because the CD8 T cells can kill them. So they pre instead, they present their antigen to CD4 T cells. And CD4 T cells are subset of T cells that have the CD4 molecule on their surface. This is why we call them CD4 T cells. And though they don't have the machinery to kill, they all, they're called helper cells. What they do when they get activated, they secrete cytokine and chemokine to attract the immune system to come and work. Uh, the CD8 T cells, again, those are T cells that have the CD8 molecule on their surface, and those are cytotoxic T cells, and they, can, they have the machinery to directly kill. 
But this doesn't explain why we have all this huge uh, diversity in our MHC molecules. So A can be A1, A2, A3, B can be uh, B52, B53. You heard all these different uh, uh, subtypes of ABC and, and, and DR, DPDQ. So imagine now we, have, we all have one um, MHC molecule that is X. And then a pathogen over thousands of years was, was able to mutate in a way that now the MHC X cannot present it on its surface for whatever reason. Uh, so now, you know, this will wipe out the whole population. However, if we have two different uh, MHC molecules, X and Y, then the, the, the people who, ca who are carrying Y will survive, and the one that's carrying X will, will basically die. So this is a, this huge, and now we have much more diversity than only two uh, uh, molecules, and this is how uh, the, uh, we, we, we protect the human race. So we, this is the chromosome six, has a, B, C, D, P, D, Q, D, R. And then we have one allele from, from mother, one allele from the father. But those are codominantly expressed molecule, which means that A will be expressed on the, A from the father will be expressed on the tissue, but also the A from the mother will be expressed uh, on the same uh, cell. So we don't have only six molecules, we have 12 molecules. So, and we always talk about, when we, when we talk about kidney matching, we talk about only six antigen. And why, why is this? This is because in the early era of transplantation, they thought that A, B, and D, R are the most immunogenic. But now we know that this is not the case, that all the other are important, but before we only were only interested about the acute rejection, now we're interested about chronic rejection. So those are important. So if you, so this is explained, so when you have a, a kidney, zero antigen mismatched kidney coming from the deceased list. So this is matching on A, B, and D, R. So this is not a perfect match kidney because the chance that with this huge diversity that the, the, uh, also the donor and the recipient are matching on uh, the rest is almost impossible. So this is not really a perfect match kidney and this is explained even when we get a zero antigen mismatch kidney from the disease list, we still give maintenance immunosuppression, we still give induction therapy. So, this is different when you have a living related kidney. So if you have a kidney from sibling, so if you're matching on A, B, and D, R, the chances that you're matching on the rest is almost 100% because we inherit those with whole haplotype. So, and there is 25% chance for a sibling to have the same two haplotype match with the, uh, with the donor. So this means that in the zero mismatch from living related, this is a perfect match. Those all 12 antigen are matching. But why we still give immunosuppressant to those patients? Well, this is because of the uh, minor histocontability antigens. Those are proteins that are present in all cells. They are important for f cell function. And they, uh, all, they, they are very polymorphic, even with, uh, between siblings. Only identical twins will have the same uh, protein with uh, the same proteins. And those, they can differ by maybe one or two amino acids that will not affect the function of the protein, but when they are carried on with the kidney, the immune system will recognize, of the recipient will recognize those as foreign antigen and will attack them. So there is risk of rejection even with a two haplotype match from a sibling, and this is why we still give maintenance immunosuppression to those patients. Now, it's debatable between, between uh, centers whether you give induction or not. Most centers end up not giving induction for those patients. So this is just to tell you the structure of the T cell receptor has a constant region here and has a variable region. And every clone has one sort of this variable region that to allow them to recognize a specific antigen. And we have billions of those different um, uh, T cell receptor. And this is just to tell you that the, CD, the CD3 positive cells, you always hear about those, those are the T cells. And the CD3 is a molecule that stabilizes the T cell receptor. The CD3 positive cell, that's the T cell, can be either CD8, and the CD8 will help the cell to 
bind to the MHC class one, or it can be a CD4 cell, and then this, can, will, this molecule will help the cell to bind to the MHC class two. This is, we, we went over this already, and this is just to, uh, you know, a summary of, of what we just talked about. So we go back to the question. 25-year-old woman with uh, reflux nephropathy has a zero antigen mismatch from her twin brother. Which one of the following is true? No need for maintenance therapy in this perfect match case. So this is, this is not an identical twin. So this is, uh, as I told you now, those patients need maintenance therapy. No risk for acute or chronic rejection. That's not true. There is a risk for acute uh, and chronic rejection. Induction therapy should be with depletion therapy. It's still debatable whether we give induction therapy or not. Most of the centers do not. This match is perfect for major and minor antigen, which is not true. So the, the right answer here is E, none of the above. So second question, 58-year-old Caucasian female with history of end-stage kidney disease due to re reflux on periton dialysis for 10 years was called in for a cadaveric kidney transplant, two antigen mismatch, non-sensitized, T-cell cross-match is negative. The uh, cold ischemia time, so at the time that the kidney was on cold outside uh, the donor, 24 hours, and the warm ischemia time is 45 minutes. This is the time that the the surgeon took to hook the vessels into this new kidney, and this kidney was, was not on, on, on ice. Um, there, uh, this is an ABO-compatible kidney. Patient was induced with Tymo, steroid, started on steroid and MMF. The surgery was uneventful. Post-op day one, urine output is very sluggish. Post-op day seven, um, creatinine, um, uh, the urine output around one liter per day, and she remi remains dialysis dependent. Um, so the creatinine is still elevated, and then the urine output is still sluggish. She's on cell sub one gram BID, FK level is 8.5. Which one of the following statement is correct? Time of induction was not appropriate as she had a good matched kidney and no preformed HLA antibodies. Patient has no increased risk of rejection, and delayed growth function is simply explained by the prolonged cold ischemia time. Biopsy is needed as soon as possible to rule out acute rejection. Tacrolimus should be stopped as it's contributing to the delayed graft function. Okay, I'll give you a few seconds. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll go. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to this. Uh, we'll come up back to this question. So it all starts when we take the kidney out of the donor. And <clears throat> this is where we induce ischemia to the endothelial tissues and the epithelial, epithelial cells within the kidney. And those cells will start secreting a lot of danger molecules, including cytokines and chemokines. The chemokines will attract the, the innate immune system into the uh, donor kidney, uh, and also will stimulate whatever antigen-presenting cells within the kidney to increase their HLA molecules to become more immunogenic. Also, the endothelial and the epithelial cells start increasing their expression of and, uh, HLA antigen. So the kidneys, when they are exposed to ischemia, they become more and more immunogenic. And the longer the ischemia time, the longer the, the, the higher the immunogenicity and the higher the risk of rejection. And this is why when you have a patient on the deceased, uh, a deceased kidney versus a living kidney, the risk of acute rejection is much higher with the deceased kidney. And those, this is the case where, and the longer the ischemia time, the, t the more the tendency to use higher dose of immunosuppressants. We use depletional induction therapy, we use high, high, high dose of uh, immunosuppressants. So, so now the kidney is in, the dendritic cells, the antigen presenting cells of the donor, so that came with the kidney, are activated and hyped up. And also the dendritic cells and the antigen presenting cells of the recipients are, are, are attracted into this kidney. They come, they, they harvest the, uh, they take 
HLA molecule of the donor, and they express them on their own HLA molecule. And those, H and those dendritic cells will migrate into the secondary lymphoid organ to encounter T cells and to stimulate T cells. So, and they do that in, do, in two ways. So that is the direct recognition, and this is the, this, the donor uh, the donor dendritic cells. So remember, the donor dendritic cells has the whole HLA molecule, an intact HLA molecule of the donor on its surface. So the T cell receptor of the recipient are able to, to re directly recognize those foreign protein. But not only that, they can recognize different epitopes on those HLA molecules. So uh, much more uh, T, uh, T cell clone will be stimulated by the donor dendritic cells. This is why this is a very strong uh, uh, reaction. However, the recipient uh, dendritic cells will take the, the donor HLA molecule, will break it down, and will present it at, at, at the surface with the recipient HLA molecule. So only very few part of the donor HLA molecule will be exposed at the surface, and less T cell clone will be stimulated. So with the indirect recognition, the stimulation is much less. And this explains why early on post-transplant, we have this very high risk of rejection because of the direct recognition of the donor dendritic cells. And those donor dendritic cells will be eliminated very quickly by the immune system. So this is a short living. And this is explained why we give induction therapy early on, high dose of immunosuppressant, and we decrease the immunosuppressant with time and also this is explained, this induction uh, therapy and this high dose of maintenance therapy early on is explained by the ischemia that is, uh, makes the kidneys more immunogenic early on post-transplant, but this goes away with time. So we go back to this question. So this is a, a patient, remember, had a, a, a deceased kidney with a cold ischemia, prolonged cold ischemia time and a warm ischemia time. And Time of induction was appropriate. This is, again, this is, makes this uh, patient at very high risk of rejection. Uh, patient has no increased risk for rejection and delayed death function is simply explained by the prolonged cold ischemia time. This, truly, this is untrue. Biopsy is needed as soon as possible to rule out acute rejection. That's the correct answer. Most of you got it. Prograph should be stopped as it's contributing to the delayed graft function. That's not true that, you know, now we need a therapeutic prograph level at this point. So. Third question, 28-year-old Caucasian female with history of SRD due to hypertension on PD for four years, received a deceased kidney transplant that is four mismatch three years ago. Non-sensitized, T cell cross match was negative. Her creatinine is 1.1. No episode of rejection or infections uh, post-transplant. However, patient developed recurrent squamous cell carcinoma over the last two years. Patient's immunosuppressive therapies are Celsept, 1 gram BID, Tacrolimus, uh, 1 BID, and prednisone 5. Which one of the following statements is correct? Switching Tacrolimus to Rapamycin is associated with decreased risk of recurrence of squamous cell carcinoma in a randomized controlled trial. PI3K mTOR pathway is highly activated in anti-cancer T cells, and mTOR inhibitors should be avoided. Patient remains at risk for rejection due to her young age, but tacrolimus should be switched to rapamycin. Prednisone should be stopped to reduce the risk of skin cancer recurrence. Tacrolimus should be switched to rapamycin and MMF reduced to 500 milligram BID within two weeks. So I'll give you a few seconds to answer here. Very good. Okay, so we'll go back to this question. So the step two that we're going to talk about is how T cell get activated, and if you if you really understand the, the this the the, um, the how this happens, you you will remember all the mechanism of action of the medication we do uh, forever. So. So the, the T, it all starts, as we said, when the T cell receptor recognizes an antigen on the, uh, pre, on the uh, MHC of the antigen-presenting cell. But if this, in this case, nothing will happen. 
always the cell will need a second signal. And this is uh, provided by a, what we call costimulatory uh, molecules. In the early era, this is, you know, we thought that those are the only uh, molecules we're dealing with, but more and more we have tons of this, those molecules, a lot discovered every year. However, the CD28 molecule is a prototype and I would focus on uh, today. So a naive T cell will have this, this is the T cell receptor, will express CD28 molecule but not CTLA4 molecule. And when it's stimulated by the antigen presenting cell, the CD28 molecule will bind to the CD8086 molecules on the surface of the antigen presenting. This is B71 molecule and B72 molecules. And this will provide a positive signal for the cell to proliferate. However, when the cell gets start act getting activated, it starts expressing this molecule, the CTLA4. And the CTLA4 has also binds to CD80 and CD86, but with higher affinity and avidity. So it starts stealing the CD8086 from the CD28, and the CTLA4 will give a negative signal, and the positive signal will start going down. And this is how the immune system, uh, the T cell, get inhibited. And this is important to, to maintain immune homeostasis. So when after the cells get activated, you want to make sure that the, the, the cell remains under control and it's suppressed. So this is why the cells start expressing the CTLA4. And if you know this biology, what you would, and you, you work in a, in, a, in a basic science lab, what you would do, it, you, you would take the CTLA4 molecule, you will fuse it to a FC portion of, the, of a human uh, uh, IgG1, and you would make the CTLA4 Ig molecule. And this is, and if you, um, and if you uh, give the CTLA4 Ig, Ig to, uh, to animals, and during the T cell interaction with the donor antigen presenting cells, the, uh, the CTLA4 Ig will bind to CD8086, will inhibit signal 2, and will suppress T cells. And this is the, uh, the, uh, the first molecule in this, in this family. And when it was started uh, moving into the uh, monkey uh, studies, um, it didn't show the um, uh, uh, same efficacy as in mice. And this is where the company started looking for uh, the mutants of this molecule, and they screened around 2,300 mutants, and they found this molecule that only differ with two amino acids but allow it to bind to CD86 uh, more, more uh, avidly than the uh, CTLA4IG molecule. And this made the, this uh, mo molecule uh, more powerful, and this is the molecule that made it to the clinic, and this is Bela Tassab uh, and Flavio Vincenti um, uh, uh, paper in New England Journal of Medicine. So this is what you need to remember. So first, it's the signal one. This is the T cell receptor recognizing the antigen uh, presented by the MHC molecule. This is, remember, this is the CD3 molecule I told you about that stabilized the T cell receptor. And the OKT3 is a monoclonal anti-CD3 molecule that will bind to the CD3 and will induce lysis of those T cells. This is, was used as induction therapy. It, it caused a lot of cytokine release syndrome, so now it's, it's no more used and withdrawn from the, from the market. But again, we said you need the signal two. This is where the CD28 will bind to your B71, B72 molecule. And this is where the co-inhibitory molecules work. This is where the belatasept work. When you have those two signals together, there is a flux of calcium that comes to the cell, and this will activate multiple phosphatases. One of them is calcineurin. Calcineurin is a phosphatase, and what a phosphatase does, it dephosphorylates protein. You have this N-fat molecule floating in the cytoplasm, carrying a lot of phosphate on its surface. So when the calcineurin gets activated, it starts cleaving those phosphate off this molecule, so this molecule can, can come into the nucleus. And here it will sit on the promoter of multiple genes and stimulate multiple genes, including the IL-2 gene. So the cells start producing a lot of IL-2. This IL-2 will go outside the cell, will bind to the IL-2 receptor on the surface of the T cell, and, cause, and, and, and brings what we call a signal three. When the, and this is where the IL-2 receptor blocker work. 
the basiliximab or the Simulac, it blocks basically the interaction of ILQ with the, with the signal. And this is a very powerful signal, and this is why we use the basiliximab as an induction therapy. So when the third signal is um, activated, PI3K mTOR pathway and the JAK-STAT pathways are activated. And what you need to remember that the PI3K mTOR is responsible for cell survival and responsible for cell proliferation. And this is why this is the most commonly activated pathway in cancer cells uh, that promotes their survival and their proliferation. And a lot of the PI3K mTOR inhibitors are, are now tried in, in, in clinical trials as uh, uh, anti-cancer medications. And also, as you know, the mTOR inhibitor, the rapamycin, is FDA approved for renal cell carcinoma. So, and here where the mTOR inhibitor uh, act on this molecule. So when the PI3K mTOR is activated, it gets the cell into the cell cycle to, to start dividing. And for cell, when the cells start dividing, it needs, obviously, synthesizing new nucleotides. And this is where the anti-metabolic, they inhibit the metabolism of purine, uh, of purine, and this is how they shut down the cell cycle. And those are the MMF and the Imuran we use. So, so the, the different classes of maintenance immunosuppression you need to know about, those are the calcineurin inhibitors, the cyclosporin, and the tacrolimus. The, you have the uh, uh, co-inhibitory molecules, the bilatasab. You have the, the anti-proliferative, those are the mTOR inhibitor. So, and this is why we use uh, uh, sirolimus. Um, we, this is the preferred agent when our patients develop uh, malignancies. So uh, we switch usually our patient, if it's possible, to mTOR inhibitors. And the, there is a, this randomized trial in New England Journal of Medicine of randomized patients who, de who develop recurrent skin cancer to either stay on Prograf or switch to uh, uh, sirolimus. And with the sirolimus arm, there was a significant re reduction in recurrence of the skin cancer. And we have a JAMA paper that showed that um, not only for skin cancer, for, but for different type of cancer, there is a decrease in uh, recurrence and mortality. And then finally, we have the anti-metabolites. The, the, those are the cell set and the EMRA. And uh, Steve Gabardi will go over this um, uh, very, uh, in the next talk. And uh, however, the induction therapy are OKT3, as we saw. We're not using this anymore. We have the IL-2 receptor blocker that works here. And this is a non-depletional induction therapy because it doesn't deplete the cell, it just in interferes with, this, with the signaling. And you can imagine that this is a weaker induction therapy than the depletional uh, induction therapy. The depletion induction therapy are alemtuzumab, which is the monoclonal antibody against CD52. And this is a molecule that's present on T cells, but also present on B cells, neutrophil, macrophages. And this is why CAMPATH can induce a severe leukopenia that can last you know, up to two years. Thymoglobulin is basically made when we uh, inject thymocyte into rabbits. The immune system of the rabbit will recognize the, um, uh, th those human, those foreign antigen, will react in against them, produce antibodies, and those antibodies are, uh, are harvested, and this is what gives you the timer. And those an antibodies react to different antigens uh, on the surface of the um, uh, T cells and the B cells, and cause depletion, obviously. So going back to this question, so switching tacrolimus to rapamycin is associated with decreased risk of recurrence of squamous cell carcinoma in a randomized clinical trial. So this is the right answer here. PI3K mTOR pathway is highly activated in cancer cells, and mTOR inhibitors are our preferred agents in this case. Patient remains at risk of rejection due to her young age. So remember, this is three years post-transplant. This is where the risk of re rejection is much less and less. Um, um, prednisone should be stopped to reduce the risk of skin cancer. So all trials that uh, try to withdraw um, prednisone uh, late uh, post-transplant had very high risk of reje uh, acute rejection, and this is not advisable. Tacrolimus should be switched to rapamycin and MMF reduced to 500 BID within two weeks. 
we don't make all these changes at once, this will uh, um, put the patient at risk for rejection. Whenever you make one switch, you wait two to three months to make a second, uh, second change. But this patient should be on much lower immunosuppressant, being three years out of uh, transplant for the, same, for the reasons we discussed already. So, question four. 42-year-old African-American female with history of end-stage kidney disease due to lupus on PD for four years is evaluated for kidney transplant from her husband. She's um, sensitized with CPRA class 1, 30%, class 2, 10%, uh, with negative CDC T-cell cross-match. Patient has anti-HLA-A1 against donor with an MFI of 2,000. Flow cross-match TNB are negative. Which one of the following statements is correct? Patient is at high risk for antibody-mediated rejection, but at no high risk for cellular rejection. Patient is at no risk for antibody-mediated rejection as the donor-specific antibody does not bind to antigens and does not activate complement as her uh, cross-match was negative. Patient is at high risk for um, both antibody-mediated rejection and cellular rejection and should be induced with basiliximab. The donor-specific antibody is a contraindication for transplant and patient should be activated on the diseased list. Um, okay. You know what, I will, I will, um, I'll skip over those two questions. We'll, we'll do them after we finish this to make it a little bit faster. So, um, so we, now we get to the third uh, step. So we talked about how the, the immune system recognized for an antigen, how it gets activated. So now the T CD4 T cells are activated uh, either through direct recognition or indirect recognition, and they start producing a lot of cytokines. And those cytokines will stimulate the different arms of the immune system. We have the innate immunity, we have the B cells, we have the other cytotoxic T cells that were attracted into the area and then uh, will help the you know, CD4 T cells to eliminate the antigen. So this is the scenario. So the T, the T cells are activated. This is, a, this is the nephron. The uh, T cells come back to uh, go through those small capillaries and go through the peritubular capillaries. And now th if you have a cross-section of the, of the nephron, this is how um, the, it will look. A normal kidney, this is how it looks. The tubules, well, this is the peritubular capillaries, and they look fine. However, now with the ischemic kidney, we have a lot of chemokines that attract the immune system. The, uh, in those peritubular capillaries, the T cells will, will, will come through. There is a lot of molecule that upregulated on the, on the endothelium of those uh, capillaries to basically slow down the T cells and attract them to go into the tissue. And this is what happens here. And you can see th those are the tubule, those are the tubule, those are the peritubular capillary that are represented here. And you have those small nuclei, those dense, those are the lymphocytes here. And basically they are coming out of the peritubular capillaries and invading the tubules and causing tubulitis. And this is what we call, this is a hallmark of T cell mediated ejection. And this is another, um, uh, you know, um, biopsy. This is a normal, this is how a normal uh, a nuclei, uh, a nuclei of a normal tubular cells will look like. And if you look here, you have this small dense nuclei. This is a lymphocyte. And you can see in this tubule here, a lot of those T cells. This is tubulitis, this is cellular rejection. Those are T cells coming out of those tiny vessels within, between the, um, the, the tubules and invading the tissue, causing interstitial inflammation and tubulitis. And this is what we call T cell mediated rejection. And this is just to show you that the cytotoxic T cells are basically uh, causing the um, uh, cell death. So another arm of the immune system that get activated are the B cells. So when the CD4 T cells get activated, they migrate into the um, secondary lymphoid organ where, where they meet the B cells. And in marginal, in the um, uh, germinal center, those B cells start proliferating and they start differentiating into plasma cells that produce antibodies. And those antibodies are specific to the antigen that uh, originally stimulated the, T, the CD4 T cells. So, and those plasma cells will migrate into the 
um, the bone where the, uh, and that where they, uh, the, they long live. And they continue secreting antibody that goes into the circulation. So now you have the nephron again, the antibodies are going through the afferent arteriole, now hit those small capillaries. And now physically, they can start binding to the antigens here, and also in the antigen in those small capillaries between the tubule, the peritubular capillaries. And then by binding on, the, on those donor, on the endothelium, they can activate complement, you know, and this is the C4D being a byproduct of this, uh, and we can stain for it, and this is how it's gonna look. So the, an the antibody is deposited in the endothelium of the glomeruli, but also in those small capillaries here, and this is a, this is a hallmark of antibody-mediated rejection. But you, you need to remember that the, the antibody does not only work through complement, and not necessarily work with complement. The antibody can bind to the um, uh, MHC of the endothelial cells and cause direct damage. Also, the, the antibody when bind to the MHC, they, through their FC receptor, they can stimulate their FC portion, they can bind to the FC receptor of the innate immunity and stimulate them to attack. So, and this is also obviously the complement activation here. And this is, look at this, so this is a peritubular capillary and this is a neutrophil that's attacking the endothelium. This is a hallmark of uh, you know, antibody-mediated rejection. This is a peritubular capillaritis. You don't need to have C4D positive to diagnose antibody-mediated rejection here. And again, so uh, typically you ca you're gonna have a donor-specific antibody in the, in the periphery that you can detect. You have this morphologic changes where there is peritubular capillaritis and also you have C4D. This is a, the, the typical presentation but also you can have a C4D negative antibody mediated rejection and this is because the, the antibody may not activate complement but activate the innate immunity to cause the rejection and also you may have, you may detect donor specific antibody or not and this is, could be two reasons. Either this is a, a, a non-HLA antibody that you have or it's below the uh, detection threshold in, this, in the periphery and all the antibodies are already in the kidney causing the rejection. So you have all these different scenarios for antibody-mediated rejection. And hyperacute rejection is basically the catastrophic presentation where if you have a preformed donor antibodies from exposure to blood transfusion, so a husband get a blood transfusion from his wife, then a few years later needs a, a kidney. So was exposed to the, the, her, her, anti, her HLA antigen before and developed antibodies against them. So now you come and you put this kidney in and within seconds, those antibodies will deposit into those micro vessels, micro, those capillaries within the kidneys, will activate complement, uh, uh, induced thrombosis and microthrombosis, and the kidney will, will, will become uh, blue within, within minutes. And this is what used to happen early on. Uh, the acute uh, antibody-mediated rejection is, a, is a, obviously a milder form of that, and the chronic rejection is when the, uh, there is a tightening of the vessels and remodeling, and this is what we call transplant glomerulopathy that's usually caused by chronic, uh, chronic injury. And I want to talk, you know, um, give you two words on the cytotoxic crossmatch. So the cytotoxic crossmatch was introduced to predict hyperacute rejection. So, Basically, if you know that the, the, some, some people have antibodies in their blood, you, you don't know, this is the era where you, we didn't know how to measure those antibodies in the, in the periphery. And you wanna know if they will bind to the kidney after the transplant and cause hyperacute rejection. What you would do? You would take a piece of this kidney, you would take the ser so, uh, serum of the recipient, you put them together in vitro, and you, you see if this, will, this antibody will bind to the kidney and will cause damage. But obviously, I mean, this is not a practical test. So this is why we take donor T cells instead and lymphocyte. We're not testing the immune system of the donor here. And this is where it confuses fellows all the time. We're just taking surrogate cells for the uh, kidney cells. The T cells will have actually class one on the surface, the same as the kidney cells. And the, the B cells will have 
class one, but also class two uh, on their surface. And so we take the uh, T cell from the donor, we add the serum from the recipient, and then we add uh, anti-antibody and we add complement. And, the, and, the, and if there is antibody, the complement will get activated and then the cell will get lysed. And this is a positive T cell cross match. And this tells you that if you do the transplant, you're going to have a hyperacute rejection. And this is the only the absolute contraindication in transplant. Everything else is relative, but this is the only uh, absolute contraindication. So, um, and the cytotoxic PRA, we always talk about PRA. The PRA is simply, um, you do, you, 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 have a, you have a recipient, doesn't have a donor yet, and you want to know how much antibody they have. You just take 100 you, have, you take T cells from 100 individuals from the, from, the, from the community, and you do cytotoxic cross-match against those, all these different 100. And if he, if he has, for example, zero, uh, zero PRA, means it didn't react, uh, doesn't have any antibody that react against any antigens. But if he has 10%, mean that he has antibody that reacted against 10% of those, uh, those antigens. And this, the higher the PRA, the higher the patient the, uh, is sensitized and more antibody, the, uh, anti, actually antibody they have. Flow cross match is simply a, a, a fancier technique of doing a cytotoxic cross match. In this case, we still take donor lymphocyte, we add the serum, but in, we don't add complement to see if the complement can lyse those cells. We only add flu, uh, fluorochrome uh, to this, uh, to this, uh, to the cells, and if the um, cell has antibody, the fluorochrome will give signal on the flow cytometry and will give us a positive signal. But this, you know, if you have a positive flow cross match, this means that you have antibodies that bind to the antigen, but this doesn't mean that it activates the complement. So, if you have a positive flow cross match but a negative cytotoxic cross match. This is not an absolute contraindication for transplant. Only the cytotoxic cross match will tell you that there will be hyperacute rejection. The positive flow cross match, though, will tell you that there is a high risk of rejection, though. And this rejection can be antibody-mediated rejection, but also can be cellular rejection. And why is that? Because everything I told you about so far, that the t the, everything starts with T cells. The T cells, when they get activated by the antigen, they activate the B cell. So if you have a B cell memory and you have antibody in the blood, def definitely you have a memory T cell against this antigen. Unfortunately, we don't have techniques to measure T cell memory. We have technique to measure the antibodies and the uh, B cell memory. So this is the flow cross match. And finally, the single antigen beads, so this is the test you hear about all the time, those are beads. In this case, we don't have a donor uh, we don't know, we don't have a, um, uh, so we, we, those are beads that each one of those beads has one uh, antigen, uh, one human actually antigen on the surface. And so we have different beads that recognize all these different known human actually antigens. And then we put them, we, we, we put those beads with the uh, serum from the recipient. And if there is any binding, we use the same technique uh, we use a Luminex technique here and ca can differentiate between all these beads and it can tell us what antibody binding to, wh to what bead. And it can tell you that, okay, you have HLA A1 antibody in the, in the serum. But this, again, this doesn't mean that this antibody, if you have a positive uh, by uh, a DSA, so by single antigen bead, this tells you that you have an antibody. It doesn't tell you if this binds. The flow cross match tells you if this binds to the antigen. And it doesn't tell you if this is activate the complement. Only the cytotoxic cross match can do that. So this is a more sensitive test that basically um, uh, is not also if you have a DSA, so a donor specific antibody by this technique, this doesn't mean that this is an absolute contraindication to transplant. This tells you that you're going to have a, um, a high risk of rejection, yes. So. Um, So we'll go back to those questions we, uh, we spoke before, uh, um, about before. So uh, this is a highly sensitized patient, has a donor-specific antibody. So patient is at high risk for antibody-mediated rejection, but at no high risk for cellular rejection. 
this is not true. It, uh, patient, if, if, if someone has a donor-specific antibody, they are at risk for both antibody-mediated rejection and cellular re rejection. Patient as n is at no risk for antibody-mediated rejection as the donor-specific antibody does not bind to antigen and does not activate complement. Uh, this is also not true. Um, patients at high risk for both antibody-mediated ce and cellular rejection and should be induced with basiliximab. So this is also not true. In those high uh, immunologic risk patients, uh, there is some data that uh, th uh, uh, depletion therapy is better than non-depletion therapy as induction. And in this case, we use usually uh, thymoglobulin or CAMPATH. Uh, DSA is a contraindication for transplant and patients should be activated on the diseased list. Um, uh, this is not true, as we said before. What is true regarding antibody-mediated rejection? Preformed DSA increases the risk of acute cellular rejection. Uh, that's true. Uh, the same thing, uh, you know, the same principle as we said before. If you have a DSA, you, had or you have already T cell that get activated in the first place, and you're at risk of cellular rejection. Preformed DSA is an absolute contraindication for transplant. This is not true. The histologic diagnosis of antibody mediated re rejection requires positive staining for C4D. We, we just said that you can have a C4D negative antibody mediated rejection. Rituximab depletes plasma cells and decreases antibody production. This is not true. So the plasma cells, when, they, when the, the B cell differentiate into plasma cell that produce antibody, they downregulate their expression of the CD20 molecule. So the rituximab does not deplete plasma cells. It depletes memory B cells and precursor uh, B cells, but not plasma cells. And this is why the bortezomib was introduced in the treatment of antibody-mediated rejection, because this is the only treatment we know about now that can really act on plasma cells. And this is simply to say that um, you know, this is how the, um, you know, after the activation of the immune system, the, immune, the T cells start uh, expressing those co-inhibitory molecules. We talked about CTLA4, but there is PD-1, TIM3, like three, all these different molecules, and those will, will suppress those T cells. This is why the risk of rejection goes down with time. However, this is a reversible phenomenon. If we reduce the immunosuppressant, the immune system can go back up. So, um, and this is a summary, and I, I will stop here. Uh, the, the rest of the questions uh, you, you have the answer for. So which one of the following is correct? <coughs> patients at no risk for the essay is containing for time some patients should be. No, so, so sorry, so for this one, uh, none of the above should be. Okay.